Alô, tá me vendo? Muito bem. Ótimo. O estilo, mas com um twist. Parece que foi sábio, não tinha recusado as fotos. Então, não chegou aqui as fotos. Ah, sim. Ah, no. Ah, não, vou tentar. <risos> do, you have, do you want one? Okay. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> so, in the mood of uh, almost Christmas, right? Let's start the last day of, of the LSSD workshop. Okay, Miguel is from the University of Rio de Janeiro, the Federal University, and he'll talk all about this, what you can do with LSST Supernova. Thank you. Thank and you. Have so, a nice talk, sir. Thank you. Hope you bring good gifts. Merry I'm not grieving. Merry <laughs> I didn't bring any gifts. So this is uh, some work I've been doing in the past years with, uh, on, on how to use Supernova in a different way than what people normally use, which means that you know, I'm not so interested now in, in measuring the expansion of the universe. The background quantities, I'm ignoring them. I'm saying, well, what can, now this is already well measured and will be okay, of course, better measured. But when you have something like LSST, you should not just aim for no better constraints on what you already have. You should, you should aim for new, brand new things, right? And brand new tests of your model. And in this spirit, I'm talking about how you can measure the, the power spectrum or the density perturbations or anything that's related to perturbation quantities with the supernovae. And in particular, I'm going to say that how can you measure both the velocity power spectrum and the density power spectrum. So, uh, so let's talk about structure, supernova structure. So uh, traditionally, you know, uh, you just assume that you have, you know, background uh, expansion at what supernova measures, distances. But you, know, you can measure structure. And the two effects that I'm going to mention here is through supernova lensing. So the lensing of the supernovae which is what I call hard. That's the hard part to do. Uh, and you can do that even without cross-correlating, because most people when talk about lensing or supernovae, they always think about cross-correlating, right? I use the supernovae somehow to measure the background, and I cross-correlate with some other tracer. Here I'm saying I'm just going to use supernovae alone. It's, I mean, I'm nothing against cross-correlating, but it's good that you have a, a self-sufficient observable because that's when, if there's anything wrong with your model or if you are observable, it will show up very clearly, right? So, and you can do the peculiar velocities, which introduces correlations in your supernovae. That's the easy part, because there's basically linear perturbation theory. Whereas the supernovae lensing, it's very nonlinear, right? So it relies a lot on simulations. 
And all the questions, that we, you know, we, we heard a lot in this workshop about this, you know, different uh, uh, issues and different you know, systematics that enter here. Right, so what you do, usually you just assume you have a, a Friedman elementary Hobson Walker back expansion and your supernova is just you know, tracing that expansion and you assume that the light from the supernova comes for us in geodesics, right? But of course we all know that we have filaments, we have voids, so there will be lensing effects and the majority of lensing is weak lensing, okay? I'm not gonna talk too much about strong lensing here. What I'm saying is basically a weak lensing effect but it's not the weak lensing that people usually think about. But I'm not talking about multiple images here. And the lensing effect, anyway, what it does, it produces a, a skewness to your distribution, right? It's your supernovae scatter will no longer be Gaussian if you have lensing. And that's the main point, that's the crucial point, okay? There will be effects that look like non-Gaussian in your lensing, in your distribution. So uh, we, there, uh, if you just take, uh, a bunch of supernovae being in the same a given redshift, right? The distribution will be non-Gaussian. The histogram will be non-Gaussian. So, yes, due to lensing alone. So what happens, it's gonna be clear, I'm gonna show some plots. So most supernovae, uh, basically what they have, they happens is they get a bit demagnified because the universe is mostly void if you think of volume terms, right? So if you go through a void, you get demagnified. A few supernovae will be highly magnified you know, there'll be, uh, and highly magnified for me means maybe 10%, 20% magnified. Uh, because they come through some awake, they pass through clusters or close to clusters. And that's what I'm saying. If you look at the Hubble diagram, there'll be a non Gaussian dispersion. So, and, and on average, we know by theory that lensing introduces no magnification, right? Because you have photon conservation. Of course, uh, you do have some, you know, some, photos. You, you can have interaction of photons in the gas, but I'm ignoring that. So this is a typical lensing PDF. This is the probability distribution. I think this is for S of one. This is the convergence, right? So zero convergence means you have no magnification, you exactly like you have left. All this region of the distribution, you are demagnified, so a little bit. And in this region, you are magnified. So the average of distribution is zero on convergence, which means magnification one. But the state of distribution is very long. Right, that's the, the whole point. So this, this is often models a log normal distribution. It has a very long tail, very fat tail. Forget the difference between the different curves. It's, it's just four different ways of computing this. And they are agreeing with each other. That's not the point of this, but this has a f no, fat tail. Ray tracing? This is a mix of ray tracing and uh, turbo GL, which is a different code, which is mimicking ray tracing. So the fact that you have a fat tail, and this is just the lens in PDF. So what you see in the final supernova data is a convolution of this guy with your, whatever your supernova intrinsic distribution is. So I'm gonna assume for discussion reasons that we assume a Gaussian, for, but we don't have to. You can even assume that it's non-Gaussian. But whatever you have will be convoluted with this, and this will introduce uh, a non-Gaussianity. And this PDF is well parameterized with the moments of distribution. So that was our idea. Let's parameterize these guys in terms of the moments. So the mean is trivial because in convergence is zero or in magnification is one, so that's trivial. But then the variance, the skewness, and the kurtosis, and we parameterize them, and we computed how it depends on different parameters. I'm gonna tell you how. But we already can guess, and it's true, that the, the most important cosmological parameters that affect lensing is omega matter, sigma eight, and gamma. Because the most, more structure you have, the more matter you have, of course, you have more lens you have. But of course, you only sense, you're only sensible to, no, the, the no, the, no, if matter was homogeneous, there'll be no lensing, right? So if sigma eight is zero, there'll be no lensing. And gamma is a little subtle effect, but it, change, it changes the growth of structure late time, so it will affect how much lens you have at late times. Gamma is the growth rate index. Okay, F is omega m to the power gamma, right? There's, yeah, it's 0.55 in GI. It's the st standard parameterization for modifying uh, growth of structure. It's, a, it's, a, it's very simplistic in a way. It's not, no. Yeah, anyway. It's just like, it's just like W, right? There's no model that gives you constant W, but we use it anyway, something like this. So, yeah? We can, I'm, for, you can, you don't have to assume that. Okay, let's assume here for simplistic, well, to make it clear the discussion, but you don't have to, and I'll discuss in a moment. So, so what you have is this. It's really this convolution of this, uh, you know, the whatever you assume for your, your spinoffing and your lensing. 
And this is what we propose in this paper here five years ago already. So the PDF, or laser PDF is the key quantity if you want to model this. And you can compute that with ray tracing in, in body simulations. And we just did this uh, last year, uh, the first ray tracing in a hydrodynamic simulation, cosmological simulation, so you can, you can use those. And of course, if you do full simulations, it's too expensive. You know, they take forever to run. So you cannot run a likelihood on full simulation. Now people are actually starting to think about and doing very simplistic likelihoods doing a set of simulations. But still, it's very prohibitive, right? You can do a few, maybe several, but you cannot do 1,000. Right? So we had to do something fast. We have to find a faster way. So what we base in, in this uh, so-called stochastic gravitational lens analysis, which is a semi-analytic approach, in which instead of simulating the whole universe, you just populate the universe with halos, navarro frank white halos, with the right mass function, with the right distribution, and you compute a ray tracing as if you were in this simulation. It's much faster because you don't have to evolve the structure. But of course, it has limitations, so we had to see if for our purposes it was agreeing with any body simulations, it is. But there is limitations. So here's some picture illustrating what Rogério was asking. This is the a supernova distribution, which is Gaussian, for no, this, this discussion. The blue line, which is, I'm cutting here, is that uh, log normal distribution. Now the tail is to the left because I changed from convergence to magnitudes. And magnitude is this weird astronomical quantity which is, you know, has a flip sign. So uh, this is the lens in PDF, and the convolution is the green. So it looks very similar. It looks like the tiny effect. But if I make this plot in log log scale, no, sorry, in log normal scale, you can see what happens is this. Like because of the lensing, you get like a bump here, like a Cosimodo hump, right, in this region here. And this is only due to lensing. So if you can measure this, you can measure this lensing effect, and therefore you're measuring indirectly your structure, your power spectrum. Okay, so that's what the goal is to have a histogram that you can measure this bump here. Okay? So if you go far enough in the bumping regime, you get in the strong lensing regime. And this our our simp our simplistic modeling is unable to capture. So we are unable to capture this region. But this is already two orders of magnitude below where the lensing effect appears. And what I'm trying to convince you is that this is the majority of the effect. But you do have to worry if you have if you if you have in your data somehow to avoid all regions where you have multiple images. All multiple images should, should be removed from your catalog for this analysis. So it's something you have to do. It's not unfeasible, okay? Because I cannot I cannot model them at the moment. The question, okay, this is usually treated as a noise, right? The extra scatter lensing, not the non Gaussian, but just the extra scatter, the variance, is, tr is treated as noise in most uh, surveys. The question, of course, is can we do the inverse problem? Can we turn this noise into signal, All right? So can we learn about cosmology from this scatter? Now, of course, yes, otherwise this talk would not exist. But uh, so we can constrain the matter spectrum. And we also have a paper saying, well, you could also use that in principle to constrain the Hellman function, right? Because usually we are cosmologists, so we're worried about cosmology. But if you say, well, cosmology is well measured with CMB, I don't care about cosmology anymore. You can just, okay, since this is also, in principle, dependent on the mass function, you can also use that for the mass function. And there's a, so there's sets of papers doing this, Todderson did this in 2005, but it was a very simplistic uh, approach that it cannot be used really in practice. But we then we elaborated this, and then some other people picked up uh, our work, uh, Ben Dayan. So this is uh, what I call the first step in the cosm and uh, the supernova recycling program, right? You just take the noise and recycle it. So the way we do it in practice is we build a likelihood, which is uh, we call the MEMO method, the method of the moments, easy to remember. So the method of the moments is just that you take the, you make, you make a likelihood with some covariance, the covariance matrix here, you know, we heard a lot about covariance matrices in this talk. But it's basically, you know, your vector data is just the moments of your PDF, right? Now the first moment, so this mu are the central moments. And the mu prime is the moment, not central, because the first central moment is zero by definition. But, so this is what people use for supernova data. This is the distance here, right? Is the mean. But now I'm saying, okay, use not only this, but these three guys. And they are actually correlated, because the moment distribution, you can compute this covariance matrix. So the first, the mean affects the third moment. The variance affects the kurtosis. It's all correlated. In fact, they all, so it's, it was actually a big headache for us to, to understand and compute, but now we think we understood the problem, solved it, it's under control. But 
it's still, you know, we proposed this in 2013, but this Macaulay and Tamara Davis and other people picked up this method and they proposed a new way to compute this covariance matrix. They claim it's a little better and it's still being developed, but you know, I think it's okay. I think it's a, it is a, it's a technicality, let's put it this way. But you have to do it, you know, you have to, uh, covariance matrix is, you know, yeah, annoying. So there you go, your Hubble diagram. And again, Rogério, what I mean is you take a, a, a bin in redshift and look at, this, at the scatter. So this is the residual diagram. So if you look at this residual diagram, by eye, you cannot know, you cannot see by eye, but you know, you should be, you should see that here in low redshift, it should be kind of Gaussian. And as you move to higher redshift, you should be more and more non-Gaussian. That's what I'm claiming, right? And if you, if you just keep being in looking at the moments, you should detect them. And the good thing is lensing, you know, it's, you, if we, can, we, we have modeled how it goes redshift. So you can say, well, maybe my Spinov is non-Gaussian because it is non-Gaussian, right? That's how they are. We say we don't care, but, you know, uh, because I, I, I can model exactly how it goes with redshift due to lensing. And unless you make a fine-tuned model that mimics that, you know, you can, you can see this. So kernel density estimator was what these guys are proposing. We are just computing the, the covariance at the fiducial point. That's it. Okay? Yeah, we can analytically comp compute it. We, we analytically compute the covariance. And these guys are doing kind of density estimation. They claim it's a little better. It's fine. I, no, but, but, I mean for the PDF, not for the covariance. For the PDF, you have to have a PDF, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the theory we computed with this, uh, we did a full likelihood, we computed it with many cosmological parameters, we know the theory. The data you just take, uh, you just bin it and measure it directly. You measure the sample moments of distribution. You measure the sample variance, sample skewness, sample kurtosis. It's actually a very direct measurement. It goes directly from the data. So it's a two-step because first you feed the cosmology, so you, you know you get the residual, and that if you do this, okay? It's a two-step, two-step program. You can do that all together. It doesn't matter. So anyway, so these are the constraints we derived back in the day. That was for 3,000 uh, DES supernovae, which means that, you know, uh, assuming that you can use the DES uh, photometric catalog completely, and LSST as well, for 100,000 supernovae LSST. So, and with this intrinsic scatter of 0.12. So this is the result we got in the Omega M Sigma 8 plane. I explain what the colors mean. So the green is the final answer. That's the final co the constraint. So let's put in LSST, you get this final constraint that I'm zooming in, which means that you can measure sigma eight with 6% precision, right? Or 30% in deaths. The red is just the new information that lensing is giving to you because supernovae already measure omega matter. That's what we've been doing for years, right? Omega matter is already measured. And the real new information is the red. So that's coming from the high moments. And when you combine, so that you get the green, right? And just to show you clearly, I overplot here the kids two sigma survey, the two sigma constraints. So you see the kids survey, which is a dedicated weak lensing survey, does a good job, of course, but the supernovae for free can give you something which is kind of interesting, you know, and comparable because first of all, in omega matter and in terms of area, right? But this is a banana shape and this is a different shape. So it's kind of interesting because it comes for free. It's there in your data, you just have to analyze it. Yeah, it's just a supernovae part. It's just a background expansion part, right? So the new information is just the red, what I'm proposing here. And it's similar to the shape of the... It is, it is similar for, it should be similar, right? We are measuring kind of the same effect in a different way, but it's completely different way of measuring because this is, the kid survey is doing basically two point correlation functions. And here is one point correlation function because I'm not correlating supernovae. Just doing magnification of normal galaxies. Of normal galaxies, not, not supernovae. So the problem is because the normal galaxies you don't know, you, you don't have a good idea, they, they have a lo large scatter. So it's the, your knowledge of the intrinsic PDF is better for supernovae. Yes, much better. The intrinsic PDF, exactly. And not only the knowledge is better, but it's much tighter. Right? The intrinsic scatter is much smaller. Because intrinsic scatter is high in noise for me. But you have a lot fewer. Yeah, yeah, we have a lot fewer. So in principle, this could be applied as well to any object, you are completely right, right? So if you, are, if you, know, if you think you know, 
your galaxy distribution enough that it's not biased. If it isn't biased, you can use anything, right? So you're correct, and we thought about this. Galaxy too much more, you know, maybe the statistics will save you in the end of the day, and it's true, you know? Uh, I did not work out this forecast, it'd be interesting, but yeah, you're right, it can be used with any object. Okay, so okay, so we, we can also measure the growth of structure. So we also, you know, in this paper here, we extended the model to include gamma. So we, you know, we had all the because for each time you need to include the parameter, you need to run a set of of of, of these uh, semi-analytic models to know how the theory is, right? Because we, we cannot compute it; we have to brute force it. So we included gamma. So here is gamma, the definition finally, Rogério. and of course, the is 0.55, and that's the result for S, S, LSST supernova that we got this blue line. So there's the, some degeneracy between gamma and sigma eight, okay? Uh, and then we combine, for instance, if you look at Euclid uh, ratio space distortion. Now, you may claim I'm cheating here because actually if you look at the, the I'm, but I'm not, I, I get, the, if you look at the Euclid papers, the ratio space distortion sense in Euclid looks much better than this. And the reason it looks much better than this is because they put a prior on mega matter. So here I'm showing, if you just you know, do the real, if, if, you, I, if I want to have complete independent, or as most as possible independent constraints, then I'm not putting any prior on Euclid, it looks very degenerate like this, okay? And when I include the, the spin-off, it becomes much tighter. But then again, as, as uh, I was just saying, most of this new information just, is just coming from the background, okay? The lensing is not giving you too much, and the lens information is the blue. So you see that you know, it's a tighter than the lensing, but it's a cross-check. Okay, so you know, super, let's talk about a little bit what Roger was asking because what is a standard candle at the end of the day? So you know, you, you assume the supernovae to be a standard candle, it means that you have intrinsic magnitude, which is constant in redshift, plus some Gaussian scatter. That's the usual assumption. Now, if you do a fine tuning M of Z, say my supernovae are evolving in redshift with metallicity with some reason like that, then you could fit all the supernovae diagram with, uh, with, uh, without dark energy and then to be no Nobel Prize. So now a question for the audience is why do you give a Nobel Prize to Supernovae? I need answers. You must have thought about this at some point, I mean, back in the day, before the BAOs came to save the day. Uh, Very good. So. There's no hint, though, in, there's no clear indication of evolution that will explain this. But, you know, I can say, well, yeah, but maybe the evolution is this, not in the spectrum themselves, this, on the way they have more mass and explode more brightly. So you're right, there's no indication, it's completely right, that's more of the case, but I'm gonna play, I'm, I'm gonna be a little bit more cynical here, and say, well, we're giving a prize because they agreed with CMBMBO, right? But it came later, the CMBMBO constraints. But it really confirmed the supernovae because many people in the community were skeptical about the supernovae data, right? In the fact that, you know, I, I, I think it's really like this. That's my opinion. And you can also use Occam's ring, which is, you know, if you just put a lambda, which is not something too exotic, you explain everything. Whereas this M of Z, as Enrique was saying, you have to fine tune a model which contradicts some of your data, like the spectra, right? You have to fudge it. Uh, and the, okay, that's what I, I had here, the, what he was uh, suggesting. So we can apply the same reasoning for the intrinsic non gaussianity I mean, I'm just say, assuming that this one might be non-Gaussian, but I'm assuming it doesn't evolve with redshift, okay? So you can put some intrinsic skewness, intrinsic kurtosis, right? And you know, it, just that it doesn't move, uh, if it doesn't increase in redshift, you can use this. And that's what we did for the SNLS3 and JLA catalog. We put a, a nuisance parameter. And it's very interesting, actually, what we get. So we can measure these intrinsic supernovae moments, right? So that's the intrinsic moments removing the lensing effect. Okay, that's just what is there. So that's the SNLS3 and JLA. And you can see that they, 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 they disagree, especially on the variance, but it's okay. We see that that's now is 0 0.06, so this guy is kind of crazy. But the, the nice thing is, you can, this is the intrinsic skewness. And you see, the SNLS3, it is, you know, excluding zero at more than three sigma. So for SNS3, you say, well, you know, this skewness cannot be zero at three sigma. And GLA say, no, it's zero at one sigma. And the reason is, 
you know, what, what I think happened here is that SNLS3 was poorly calibrated. That's what the conclusion they have, right? That's why Omega Meta went from 0.22 to 0.29. They say it themselves. Well, we had a problem in calibration or in, in, the, in the light curve fitting, actually, and they solved this, and then, you know, it corrected for this. What I'm saying is, you know, from, from the in central limit theorem arguments, if I look at the data and I see a non-zero intrinsic skewness, I'll be worried. So this can also be used as a cross-check, you know? I would be worried if I had it. I don't expect this. Wait, how, how, how many of these is intrinsic? It's a constant term. It's a term which is constant in redshift. Right? It's a term which is constant in redshift. Yeah, That's the fit. That's the data, right? So, yeah. So, so we should take the account magnification and everything is in there, no? Yeah, but no, but because magnification due to lensing cannot be constant in redshift because lensing is not constant in redshift. So it could be, I don't know, some systematics, of course, but I'm saying only that if I, I don't expect this in the data. So if it's there, it's some, the data is not clean. That's what I mean. That's what I, I think. Now let's go to the caveat, is that uh, supernova lensing, you know, is full of systematics, okay? And I don't claim that it's well understood yet completely. So what's the influence of baryons, for instance, it was discussed here. And I have now done a retracing in baryon simulation. And we are doing a follow-up paper to see how it affects what I'm saying here. It's not done yet, so I cannot, I don't know the answer yet. But there's something, what's the, what about those very small scales? When you do ray tracing in simulations, let's, let's forget now the method I was saying. Let's do full ray tracing, the most brute force thing you can do. It still has big limitations. It's impossible to achieve in, in simulations, cosmological simulations, big enough to do these kind of things. Resolutions, angular resolutions much better than 0.1 arc second. It's impossible. But if you look at the light bundle of a supernovae, the, the angular aperture of this is 10 to the minus 6 arc second. So you're extrapolating your simulation from 0.1 arc second to 10 to the minus 6, assuming that will, everything will be OK. You know? You just have to wear a hat like this and say, I believe. <laughs> right? But it's fine. I mean, you can, you can try to do, you know, you can see if the results are converging, right? So in this paper that I did here, we went all the way from 10 arc seconds to 0.4 arc second, and it was some results were converging, but for instance, strong lensing for sure not converged, right? So it is something you have to worry about. So, I, uh, so it's, it's possible that black holes and stars could introduce some important correction. That was the question, right? So um, the solution must come from a, a, a mixture of analytical and semi-analytical modeling, not only the, the ray tracing. So there's papers by Fruhi and collaboration of Philippe Uzan that were this. There's also this nice paper by Miguel Zomaracarik and Urseliak that came one year ago that they put tight constraints for the black hole dark matter models from using exactly this, the lensing of supernovae. They said that basically if you have three model black holes, you, you, would, you can then you can compute it semi-analytically, and then you would have much more lensing in the supernovae data than we see. And from that, we are ruling out this in a good chunk of space space. I have a question. So this paper by... Yeah, yeah, go on, go on, go on. Uh, so my understanding is that they had some trouble with the publicly available data sets. Yeah. And that the supernova that were like very far away from the Hubble diagram were basically just dropped and called yeah. weird. Outliers, yeah. But we throw away outliers, yeah. These would be exactly the kind of ones that would show up if it's there true. were this lensing. So does the you fact... Are correct. So do you guys account for this or is it not an issue in your case because you look at weaker types of lensing? No, no, this is always, yeah, this is always a problem. In our case, we just take the release data, right? I'm, when you compute it with the real data, we just took it them as, you know, as face value. But you are right. In principle, right, if you are throwing away lie, outliers, it could be that they are just because of the lens, right? So in our case, I'm throwing away, I have to throw away anything which is very strongly magnified because I'm not even, so it is, for us, is the, the right thing to throw away everything which is very highly magnified because I'm not computing them. It's like the, the multiple image supernovae that was discussed here by uh, Menegetti, just throw it away. You have to do that. But for them, you're right. It is uh, a source of uncertainty, right? But they, they, they argue in their paper that, you know, even allowing for that, it would not explain the model, right? And it was, it was published in period like that. But you are correct. So now, uh, let's do intermission because, you know, 55 minutes is too much. So... Let's talk about something else for 10 seconds. 
is you probably may be aware that you know the IAU just renamed the Hubble Law. Now it must be called the Hubble and Matrix Law. Yes, it was it was decided by the IAU. You know, you have to do this. And by doing that, they broke Merton's law of eponymy. I don't know if you know about Merton's law of eponymy. You don't know about that. You should know. Is that no discovery is ever named after its original discovery. It's a law. And to make it recursive, it was proposed by Stigler. <laughs> so Stigler proposed it and named it after Merton. Okay? And you can think, well, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not true, but there are many examples in physics. Okay? So there are many examples of Stigler's law, right? Uh, which is uh, uh, a Haranov bone effect, which is proposed by Ehrenberg and Sidé. Arabic numerals were invented by in Indians. Euler number was Bernoulli. Snell's law was Ibn Saun. Gauss theorem was Ostrogatsky. Gaussian distribution was De Moivre. Reynolds number was Stokes. And Stokes law was Lord Kelvin. So Stokes kind of got it away, you know, one by one, you know, just traded. Okay? And, uh, and one other thing, which I always have to say, since this, this is the South American workshop, you know, I don't know about America, but it was not America Vespucci, you know. You can choose whatever you prefer, you know, but I can say what, who was not, right? So you have to, you know, the, 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 for the students, there's, a, there's a, something here to learn. You don't have to be the first. You just have to be the one named after, okay? <laughs> Think about this. Be the second, but be, be, be loud. So that's the end of the intermission. Let's go back to hard physics. Hope you had a good time. So, supernova and peculiar velocity now. Now I'm no longer talking about lensing anymore. So again, lensing only affects far away supernovae, let's say beyond 0.4, because the lensing kernel, that's how it goes, right? Uh, at low redshift, let's say up to 0.3, although this is not a hard limit, you can go beyond, there's another effect that becomes relevant, which are the peculiar velocity effects. So in cosmology, uh, you know, uh, anything which is outside the Hubble flow is what we call peculiar velocity. Now, the typical peculiar velocity at redshift zero is around, I say, 600 kilometers per second, which means V over C of 2 10 minus 3. So this would be an extra blue redshift, right, on top of your data. So when people are talking about redshift, they say there's a cosmological redshift, which you want to know, was also alluded here in the different talks, but then some extra noisy redshift, which is the peculiar velocity one. Now, at low Z, this can be can be quite high and gives a large relative error. And in fact, in the supernova catalogs, the, near, the, most, the most nearby supernovae, the error budget is mostly due to peculiar velocity, right? Now, uh, the crucial point here is, of course, is that peculiar velocities are correlated, right? And correlation just means that you are probing, you no, know, the two-point correlation, you're probing the power spectrum. So we can measure this uh, and infer the power spectrum by looking at the correlations on the supernovae magnitudes. So now I'm talking about two-point correlation functions, whereas in lensing I was talking about the one-point correlation function. Sorry. Yeah? Uh, if you're just considering the, the galaxy movement, of the movement inside the galaxy. Right, so the linear part, is, as you completely right, is just the large-scale flow. Locally, you're going to have the supernovae, for instance, rotating around the galaxy, and that's non-linear, and I cannot model that. So for that, we just put a nuisance parameter, which is an extra 300 or 150 kilometers per second scatter that accounts for all nonlinear velocities as, for instance, the rotation of the supernovae. So it has some intrinsic, intrinsic uncertainty because of nonlinearities. But it's like an intrinsic scatter for the supernovae. You just put an extra term there, and it's fine. I'm a bit confused. So, so what, what, what is so the, the, there is a, there is a fluctuations which produce some peculiar velocities, but there are also nonlinear things like in local groups and classes that produce the bigger part of the peculiar velocity. So, which one is the one that you're trying to constrain? So, I'm interested on the linear part, and the nonlinear part for me is just noise. So, I just treat it as noise. Okay. So, so I, so, I put so an extra term for noise that. So let, let me say. So, the nonlinear part contains both the, the nonlinearities coming from the Galaxies moving in the clusters and so on. And it's mostly it's mostly inside the galaxy, I, I guess. Okay. I mean, galaxy. Well, let's put it like this, right? Galaxy inside the cluster is a transition regime, right? Between linear, it's mildly nonlinear, I guess. I don't know. Well, it's virialized. So that's why I would say it's fully nonlinear. Okay, it's it's you can say it's fully nonlinear. Fine, it's fine. Okay. So anyway, that is noise for me. That is the noise. That is noise. You're right. Okay. So basically, you're correct, right? Basically, I'm talking about peculiar velocities. I mean, somehow correlations between clusters. Let's put it that way. Okay. You're right. You're right. 
But I'm not going to that detail. I'm just putting some extra term here for noise, right? But you're correct. You're correct. I'm not making any, any assumption about the visualization of the classes, for instance. Okay. Okay. So basically, you, know, if you, you need to be close to each other, but not too close, right? But if you're close to each other, you should have correlations. So this is a part of the normal Hubble the residual diagram. And so basically, you know, if you have a receding supernova here, which has peculiar velocity going or actually has an excess probability of also be receding. It's just like we always excess probabilities, right? And this excess probability is, is proportional to your sigma 8 and also to your gamma, right? So this was originally proposed uh, on this PRL paper by Gordon London Slosa. And we have uh, developed it further uh, a couple years ago. So now I'm going to show you some plots to get the intuition going. So this is the residual Hubble diagram, where I put. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I like Merton's law of eponymy. So uh, <laughs> just for simplicity. Anyway, so. <laughs> Now I'm, I'm doing a, a simulation with intrinsic, a calculation with intrinsic dispersion zero. So all supernovae have no dispersion at all. So all you see here is coming from peculiar velocities. And you see, if you only have peculiar velocities, you can see by eye that there's big correlations here in redshifts. Yeah, I'm just plotting them in redshifts. I'm not even plotting them in the sky. Okay, this is a patch of 400 square degrees that I simulated. And of course, if you do one realization, it look like this, another realization will look like that, and another realization can, no, sorry, this is one realization, this is another. And this is if I include now the scattered typical supernovae. So by eye, you don't see anymore. Not easy to see by eye, right? But now if you, this is because I throw away here in this plot all information about where they are. But if you build a likelihood code that takes into account where they are, then you can compute this guy. It's just like what you do for galaxies, right? So now we did a, a, a simplistic uh, forecast, including 3,000 dark energy survey supernovae plus 1,000 low Z supernovae. And that's the hard part, because you don't have a 1,000 doses per supernovae. And in fact, you know, it's a simplistic uniforming redshift, which is also not very realistic. But it gave a good idea. So the lensing part I was discussing gives this blue contours in the sigma 8 gamma plane. And the peculiar velocity gives, a, gives this contours here. Right? So they are kind of orthogonal. So if you combine them with this data set, you could have tight constraints on the combination of gamma sigma 8. OK? So again, gamma is just telling you how structure grows. So they grow slow on this part of the space, and they grow fast here, right? So if they grow fast, you need smaller sigma 8. That's kind of what he's saying. And if you grow slow, you can have larger sigma 8. Because again, this is measuring the peculiar velocity power spectrum, the velocity velocity power spectrum, right? So let's just take a look at how the supernovae are distributed in the sky. So this, uh, you know, the more wider plot, I do CMB stuff, so I like more wider plots. So this is the galactic coordinates here, galactic in the center. This is the CMB dipole, there's a metaphor I'm saying here. And this is the, you know, you probably know what is this, is the stripe 82, right? That's the, the SDSS supernova all there. And that's the, you know, the supernova we have nowadays. So we're not very well, you know, the sky is not very well covered. And in fact, if you make a 3D plot, let's take this plot and put in 3D, so I'm gonna differentiate the redshift. And that's what we get. So this, on the, no, below is redshift zero, above is redshift one. And you basically see that all the high redshift supernovae we are seeing today is coming from four pillars, very narrow pillars. So, no, basically think about it. The empty volume on this plot is what LSST should cover. You know, half of it at least because of the sky, one third of it. There's lots to gain because all the information of lensing is coming from these four pillars. And all information of peculiar loss is basically coming from the stripe 82. You see? Because these guys, no, the correlation between these guys and the is zero, basically, too far away. So it's still lots of improvements we can make. Now, this correlation are linear, so that's this. Part. Now, the JLA data themselves, they kind of removed this because they didn't want, so they removed from the data. So we had to go back and, and put it back in. They, they had by hand removed some terms, we had to go back in. So we did a, a full CMC analysis with 14 parameters, the six cosmic parameters plus eight nuisance parameters. So these are the typical supernova nuisance parameters, the delta M, sorry, the, the intrinsic magnitude, alpha, beta, of south, delta M is the step. Then we included four new ones, 
So this, uh, Marco, is the nonlinear velocity term that we put by hand and we fix. It's just a constant guy. We allow the MCMC to tell us how much it is. Then we have the intrinsic scatter for the low Z supernovae, then the intrinsic scatter for the high Z supernovae, and the intrinsic um, uh, skewness. Now, we need priors for H and S and omega baryons because supernovae are unable to, to measure them. So we need priors for these guys. For the others, we don't need priors. Right, so this is the, no, again, a step on the recycling supernovae program. So that's what the results we got. That's real data here. So the piccolo velocity is this big blob here. The lens is the big blob there. And the combination is the orange blob. So not you know, a very precise measure of gamma. But you know, as I said, we can have lots of room to improve. And the star mark the CMB kind of point we think, right? So we are, OK, two sigma-ish, that's fine. OK. Now I can take it, I can do what we like to do is imagine I project this into one dimensional plot. So this is the constraints on sigma eight and gamma. So I put it, the full constraints in blue or the one where I say I fix gamma because I say I know it's GR. So that's the constraint on sigma eight. So you have nice constraints on sigma eight. You can rule out sigma eight equals zero. Yay, there is universe, you know, we are here. And gamma is what we can do. And if you can fix the power spectrum, say I know the power spectrum, I measured well, I just want to measure deviations from GR. And then you can do this. And the point 0.55 is kind of two sigma-ish, and a lot, lot of theorists like to write papers on that, but I wouldn't worry too much. And you, you can get, you know, constraints on everyone, and, and that's the, the nonlinear term is here, Marco. So you see, it allows, it, it is a non-Gaussian thing, you know, it allows guys who have 400 and someone has 50 uh, changes. And the intrinsic mu tree, again, is, is not exactly zero, as maybe I would prefer, but it's one sigma-ish and a half, so it's fine. Now, if you compare the data, you know that's where we stand. So this I, I stole from this month's uh, uh, paper. So there's CMB, clusters, galaxies, and supernovae. But again, supernovae is a huge monster, mammoth. But you know, if you just combine with CMB, you can rule out all this region here. So it's already good. You have a question? Yeah, um, the plot. Yes. Distribution H, uh, so... Which distribution? H? Yeah. This is the prior, basically. You see in the ah, prior. This is the prior. I need priors, so you, I need priors for these three parameters here. H and S and omega baryons. So, so basically the, what you see is the prior. Did you use uh, his uh, prior? No. It's I, yeah, I, I don't remember. I think we use Planck plus some extra. We allow, for, we allow a Planck with a three sigma... Okay. I don't remember. I, I, don't, I don't remember which prior we use. We try to be something that fits both CMB and local okay. H not measurements. Okay. Kind of, it's a, no, for an yeah, for an S we use no. The S is the this is the prior range, right? So an S is basically a top hat here. Yeah, it's, it's top hat prior for an S. So an S I need a top hat prior omega baryon, which is here. Sorry, H is here and omega baryon. Ah, okay, H and omega baryon. We we omega baryon and H we got from BBN. Basically, we use BBN prior. So we need a prior for these three, right? Because actually H, the peak velocity is sensitive to H, but it's a very small dependence. It's a very mild dependence. So we have to put a prior. Sorry, and this, so this is what we get here, and that's what, we, you know, with this uh, 4,000 catalog work we could do. Of course. No, you still well. You can call it alpha, right? Is is the is H and M a, a product of them? Is what you can measure with the supernova. It's just a product of H and M, right? H and M is what you you have this product. But on the peculiar velocities, only H enters. So in principle, you could break the degeneracy. In principle, but in practice, the data is incapable yet of doing that. So what I did is I put prior on H, and that gives, of course, constraints on M. So, okay, so this is what I'm saying. You can get to this, and this is the peculiar velocity you could get if you had this 1,000 low Z supernovae. But, but this is a very unrealistic for, uh, it's an unrealistic forecast, right? Because I was assuming a flat Z histogram. So uh, 
you know, in, in Picurus, I'm all pronounced a low Z. And the Hubble flow is large for, for high Z. So, and the, but the volume increases as redshift cube. So your signal is going down in redshift because the peculiar are being swamped by the Hubble flow. But the volume is increasing a lot. So you have a competition of signal to noise there. And who wins in this competition? So I didn't know the answer to the question. So I said, let's write a paper. Because uh, most peculiar studies only consider spinover up to redshift point 0.1. And I had intuition that this is not true because volume is increasing a lot. You, know, you, you can't stack them. So uh, we are doing, we are just about to finish a paper now. Uh, uh, we're supposed to put it this week, but even now I don't know if it's good enough to, if we should put next week, because no one will be reading archive next week. I think I'll wait for January. But we're about to finish a paper. And uh, what we're doing is just doing computing how it goes, right? So we want to know how it depends on the area of the survey, the depth, the duration of the survey. And of course, you can get a good idea but what, using Fisher matrix. We are not using Fisher matrix to do our calculation, but you can get intuition. It's good to get intuition, right? It's all well developed for the power spectrum anyway. So that's the feature matrix of the power spectrum. I'm sure you've seen this before. It's in most cosmology books nowadays. Uh, and it's the same here for us. Yep, it's the same effect, right? This is the, the what well, it depends on your volume and it depends on the, the, the number density here, right? So if you do just one, one dimensional likelihood, I'm gonna fix everyone now and just vary one guy. Then, of course, the, the inverse of the Fisher matrix just gives you, uh, sorry, the, the square root, this is one half, right? The minus one half of the Fisher matrix gives you the, the, the scatter. So that's what the scatter looks like. Right? It's proportional to your area, omega is the area. Your maximum redshift, basically to, you know, to the maximum redshift one half, this is an approximation. And you integral of your power spectrum where the number density enters here. So the difference between this and the galaxy catalogs is that the number density, it keeps growing as you observe more and more because supernovae keep exploding. Whereas galaxies, once you cover the area, that's the end, that's it, right? So if you just keep observing, you keep you know, increasing your number density. And of course, if you are in the low number density regime, you are short noise limited. If you're in the high end regime, you are cosmic violence limited. And you want to be in between a bit. You want to, to, to get all the, good information where you, you're still not causing violence limited. So that's how it looks. So that's a relative error, let's say in sigma eight, right? In arbitrary units here, and then the number of density of supernovae. And it goes like this, right? You start in the short noise regime where you go like one over n, so you learn a lot. So it means that if you, usually when you have data, you double your data, you get square root of two. But here, no, you double your data, you get factor of two, clean factor of two in this region until your cosmic violence starts to kick in and you go to a region where you gain one half, and then you, it goes to, no, the, it saturates. So LSST from one to 10 years are plotted here. So what I, wa what I want you to take away is SST is still in the rich region where you keep gaining, gaining, gaining a lot by increasing N. So you can extract lots of information all the way to 10 years. In fact, it will take around 50 years of LSST that you'd be here in this regime where the cosmic violence is trying to be very important. So you can do SST for 50 years. Write that down, please. Yeah. Keep, keep on going, more money. So, of course, for these numbers here, I'm assuming that you don't, not all op, uh, supernovae that explode in the field of view will be observed. Of course, SST will miss some supernovae, and other supernovae will not have good quality for doing photometry. And I'm not assuming that you're gonna have spectra of all the guys, so this is, Basically, 10% is what survived the quality cuts. So we conducted a brute force likelihood analysis, which is not doing Fisher matrix. Uh, but uh, the, these codes are very slow. Because if you want to compute this, you have to, be, at least me, I don't know any, any, I mean, the code I wrote is basically very slow. It's my own code, together with Lan Hui's code, which did this, this pair V code of Lan Hui's computer covariance matrix that's been over. That's fine, I use that. But then I generate more catalogs with my own codes based on that covariance matrix. And then I do the likelihood. Now, we see the two cases. One, we see the ideal case with 100% completeness, no quality cuts. And we conducted that in an you know, arbitrary region of 600 square degrees, six year survey up to ratio 0.25, and that gives you 11,000 supernovae. And then we did a specific forecast for SST using the, SIM, uh, the SNANA SIM lab. CLIB, sorry, that is provided by the collaboration. So the collaboration has worked and provided already a CIMLIB, uh, let's say, uh, uh, how do you call it, parameter 
uh, definition of all the survey parameters, observational strategies that are already there. So whatever you get should be kind of realistic from the final LSST. And include many quality cuts following what LSST people have proposed to do. So, and also we assume a fiducia supernova explosion rate, and that's fine. It's constant in redshift because we're not going very deep in redshift, so it's, it's a good approximation to just do constant. Now, I also want to point out that LSST is not the only one which is going to be good for this kind of, uh, of objects. You know, because you're going to have, of course, 100 times more, but a low Z, kind of low Z, what is relevant for peak velocities, you don't need such a you know, big telescope, in fact. So the, the, the Paloma, the Zwicky Transient Facility, is also very promising. I'm not a part of it, but it's a 1.2 meter telescope with a 47 square degree field of view. It's a huge field of view. It's ridiculously huge, right? So it's a small telescope, but look at the size of the, of the sensor, right? Of the field, the filter tray, so it's huge. So this is the, the, the final completeness we get. That's the LCST based on the maximum depth of the survey. And you can get all the supernovae all the way to 0.7, in principle. It will be exploding in your CCD somewhere. But if you put the, the quality cuts you need, like the number of repetitions in each filter with high signal to noise, and all these things you need for a good light curve fitting without the spectra, then you drop 90%. Okay? It's still a lot of supernovae. But the completeness is around 0 0.1, 0 0.2. This weak transit factor is supposed to be you know, kind of complete all the way to 0.1, and then it starts to drop. But that's if you do 30 second uh, exposures, if you do two minutes exposure, which is still enough cadence for the supernovae uh, uh, detection, you can go a little deeper, up to 0 0.2, 25, and 3. So it could be interesting to, to, to see what they can do. They already have first light on that anyway. So that's uh, the results. That's the ideal constraints. Again, 600 square degrees only. And I'm showing there's many things here, but that's how it goes in different redshift beams of 0 0.05 width. And that's the, 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 what you get for sigma 8. That's the mean in all simulations we did. So at, let's say, six years, you can get uh, all the way to, to uh, say, 0.4 in this area. But that's a small area. The point here I want to make in this plot is not the numbers, because that's an you know, arbitrary area that I chose. It's not LSST. The point to take away here is that it's kind of constant in redshift. It's not exactly constant, but the information is, though, is there all the way to 0.25 at least. So most of this, well, people only consider this up to 0.1, and they are dropping out lots of information. It can go up to 25 at least, and probably even more. But the computational complexity becomes untenable for me here. So I could not extend this there, not in the brute force way. You can do the Fisher matrix way, but not the brute force way. So it is. Uh, there's Almost constant. So this is in different beams. Now if I integrate, you see it kind of drops down. The Fisher matrix theory is here in dot dashed line. The real results are here. Kind of up to 20% is the Fisher matrix. It's OK. All right. But that's the ideal case. Uh, it also can see how it goes in time. So you, you improve a lot after from one to six years in the ideal case. You know, again, the Fisher matrix, so this is the Fisher matrix for, for the, the, the 0 0.05, the Fisher matrix for 0.25 in red. This is the same information, just plotted in a different way, here and here. And you see it's still, uh, uh, still okay, it's still, you know, 0.2 error in sigma 8 with only 600 square degrees, ideally. And you can also do the same in gamma. So in gamma, you also see this kind of constant in redshift. So you still have information again at 0.25. The peak of the information is here at 0.10, 0.15 but there's still information at 0.25 beyond. So let's summarize in a table, numbers, and now I have LSST numbers to show. It's the preliminary numbers, but LSST, peculiar velocities, and only using the photometric uh, supernovae, not any spectra. In five years, you know, that's the area, that's the number of supernovae at up to 0.25, and that's the error in the sigma 8 you get. So around 0.1 in sigma 8 and 0.18 in gamma. So it means, 12% errors in sigma 8 and 33% error in gamma for free with the supernovae, only using the supernovae information. Okay. And this can be improved if you have spectra of the supernovae, you can have more, right? Or if you increase somehow your completeness by doing a better job with your uh, at curve feature. And ideally, you can improve this still a factor three or four, but not much more than this. So if you compare ideal case, five years, look at the whole sky, 
I mean, I'm a theorist. I can think of these things, right? I'm seeing the whole sky, right? So then you can go up and get, you know, this kind of bottom limits you can get. So 0 0.02 error in sigma 8, 0 0.025 error in gamma. You cannot, no, that's it. Forget it, right? In five years, that's it. And basically, ideally, after five years, you are already getting to the cosmic violence limit anyway. So that's the end game. But SSD is not too far off, you know, a factor of five-ish, six-ish from the, from the final best thing you can do. Now, of course, this is only using the supernova data themselves. You can do much more, of course, if you cross-correlate it with, you know, uh, LSS data, right? Uh, so there's this paper by uh, Skovakriki, Macaulay, I think Tamara Davis is also here, which they do, and they say that you can get, you know, uh, some signal noise of eight if you do cross-correlation of LSST supernovae and, uh, uh, and the SST uh, galaxies. Okay. There's also another paper that I just came, uh, David Alonso was just pointing out to me that came out last year uh, by Alex Kim that does something, uh, some similar discussion. I have to, to still take a better look at it. Now, of course, you can do all the cross correlation, right? Uh, you can do the group velocity with pressure, pay distortion, etc. So this is just the beginning of the game, right? But anyway, I, I conclude with this. So takeaway messages. Spinova can constrain perturbation parameters. You know, we are already at a stage that we can, no, let's, let's move beyond our background small pool and swim in a deeper ocean. So uh, lens and picot are very complementary among themselves. One affects mostly redshift beyond 0.4 and adds non-Gaussianity to your Hubble diagram, one point correlation function, where the Spinovi goes all the way to 0.3 at least and introduces correlation, so it's two point correlation function in your Hubble diagram. And the thing is, the lensing is measuring basically P delta delta, whereas the velocity is measuring P V V. So of course, you can learn a lot of things by doing two different measurements, right? You can learn about nonlinear biases. You can learn about different things, because the bias, for instance, does not enter the P V V. There's no bias in P V V. So by combining both, maybe you can see the bias very well. Right, of course, I'm assuming in all this talk that the systematics can be kept under control. And it's not, you know, it's always the big problem. Although this is a different kind of servo, so it has different systematics, right? Whatever affects, uh, well, whatever affects your W, not necessarily affects this, right? So you, you also have to throw it anyway. uh, And it's anyway a nice cross check of Lunar CDM. We need to do more cross checks of Lunar CDM. It's been around 20 years now, so we need to, you know, keep testing the, it in different ways. And of course, don't throw away the noise, you know, just recycle it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Miguel. Very controversial talk. <laughs> Do you have questions? I didn't know it was being controversial. So it, it didn't say much about the covariance matrices. Can you say something? How do you estimate the covariance matrices for PVV and also for the uh, um, non-Gaussianity, the moment, the different, you know, the, the, for the first part for the lensing? So the covariance, so I, I'm, so theoretically, the, the, I mean, given a supernova distribution redshift and space positions, right? I use this this code by Lam Hui that you just give us input the redshift and the angular position where they are in the sky. And then it computes for you the covariance. It's all linear theory covariance anyway. It's basically do, doing linear theory computation. Now it computes the covariance for you. Now, uh, you are worried, I guess, maybe of the data. Right? So the data, if you take GLA data, the one we applied, then the GLA data gives you nine covariance matrices. Right? It gives a covariance matrix which has a Malmquist bias, the covariance matrix which has lensing effect, a covariance matrix that it's all separated in the JLA paper. What we did is we took the peculiar velocity covariance matrix and said, no, don't use that. Use the one you compute for this effect. And then have a free parameter which tells you how much correlation you have. So we took all the nine covariance matrices that it gave, one we threw out basically and say, no, use this. Don't, don't, don't just put it as noise, but put something that depends on the parameters. I don't know if that answers your question. Maybe I should have put this in the top. 
so, so I, I'm, I'm still a bit confused about the method. So the way that P delta delta measured is measured here is through the lensing of, um, along the line of sight. Now, with PVV, you're trying to do something more direct. You're measuring velocity field yeah. uh, using supernovae and trying to get, for example, the constraints in the linear power spectrum. Yes. So uh, why not, for example, using really positions of, of uh, supernovae to measure the linear power spectrum? It is, uh, wow, wow, wait. So isn't it easy? Like BAO, BAO, for instance, something like this. Sorry? To do some kind of BAO analogous. Not, 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 not even the BAO, just like measure the power spectrum yeah. So the, the, it the point seems of, to me that this is more difficult. Than the that. point is, yeah, yeah. But the point is, supernovae are very. You have very few of them. I, again, I have 11,000 supernovae in my catalog, where I have 10 million galaxies. So cannot compete. In, in if you just try to trace the density field with the number of objects, it's completely. No, it doesn't add enough. But I, I'm not trying to compete with with the galaxy surveys, obviously. I'm trying to compete with the constraints from PVV. It seems to me that if you use the same subset of supernovae to measure the clustering of them or to measure their velocity field, maybe, I don't know which one means. Because yeah, I have the impression, I understand what you're saying, but the, when, you, when you're measuring the clustering of them, you're throwing away the best thing that Spinova have, that they are standard candles. You're just using the redshift and position, right? So I think that I, I, I didn't, I don't remember if I computed some back of the other thing, but if you just say where they are, how they're clustered, all the fact that they are standard candles is irrelevant. So, so, but, but maybe then I missed that. How, okay. how does it help that they are standard candles for velocity, PVV? Yeah, yeah, because, okay, so the point is, um, is this way, right? Well, let's put it this way. In order to do the two-point correlation function, I just had to measure the separation between them. And the fact that they are standard candles gives me much, uh, in the separation is the distance. So the fact that they are standard candles gives me a much let's say, clean measure of the separation. If I spin over here, spin over there, I can compute the separation in a clean way. If you're not using uh, the, the, the fact that they're standard candles, like galaxies, then I don't, I don't, I just know the redshift, but I don't have information on how the distance. So I have either to assume some cosmology. Uh, if you have just points, yeah. you use the value of the standard candles, measure the redshift. It seems that... It is similar, just the fact, the, the fact that, uh, well, you can do that, but I have the impression that you're going to have less signal to noise. And the reason I think is, if you just use the redshift position where they are, for instance, then you get all the problems. For instance, you, yeah, you have extra effects like redshift space distortion effects that will. In the fact, if you just measure the brightness of them, this is kind of corrected for a bit. Okay. Not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not convincing you. I guess, but. But it. you're right. Maybe there's extra information you can use just by the clustering of them. You're, in the sense, you're right. Maybe there's more, right? I think that's what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Question. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I understand correctly. Um, from CMB, uh, the dipole of CMB, we get a vector, right, uh, of a given magnitude. Uh, through this analysis, would you get an independent determination of uh, the movement of the local group with respect to the CMB? Well, right. So it's uh, so the point is the CMB dipole is measuring the total velocity of the solar system with respect to the rest CMB rest frame, right? Now, in principle, what I'm measuring here, so there's a, this, this is one component that we have in our analysis that we subtract. Right, we remove this, there's a dipolar component that we are ignoring here for this analysis. Because what I mean is, you know, uh, I, what I, I just want to see the, the, the correlations between the synovia themselves. The fact that I'm moving there or here, I'm subtracting our motion away from this. Now, in principle, you can also try to constrain our motion to other supernovae, but it's a different method. I mean, because it's just a dipole modulation of the supernovae. So this information is there in principle. People have been measured this. You don't have to use this technique. You just look for dipolar modulation of your data. But they get very weak constraints on the, on the dipole. Right? But it's, a diff it's true. It's there. It's physical. But it's a different method. And uh, yeah. Well, no further questions. I guess you can ask Miguel during the cough break. Thank Let's you. Let's thank him again. <laughs>
te pergunta. Nobel Prize. Ah, o Nobel Prize, é verdade. É verdade, até esqueci o Aqui, ó. Pô, esse negócio esquenta com a cabeça. E aí? Thank you. 